Hello everybody, welcome to the Sim Hanger. My name's Mark and thank you very much for watching. And let's get started. If you recall over the last couple of weeks and months, I've covered the AMD 7800 X3D chip and looked how it performed and how very well it performed in Microsoft Flight Simulator. And I did this in conjunction with Dan from Wired to Fire. And I'm really pleased to say that once again, Dan has been able to join me. So welcome, Dan, and thanks very much for joining. Hi, Mark. Thanks for having me once again. Following the various videos that I did in the past, we've received quite a lot of questions and queries, both directly to me via um, Discord as, as well as in the comments section. And I know Dan has had lots of different phone calls and what have you. So what we're going to do in this video is for those that are not too familiar with the PC and the various components, we're going to have a look at one of the pre-built systems from wired to fire we're going to jump into the config and we're going to take it apart and discuss the various aspects and options available the benefits and the downsides perhaps of various selections that we may choose so that perhaps this will give you some more insight into what you should be looking for in terms of specking a pc in the future but our focus is going to be very much on Microsoft Flight Simulator. So Dan, with that, let's jump across to Wired to Fire's website and let's get started. Right then, if you can see that we are now on the Wired to Fire homepage, obviously we specialize in gaming and flight, uh, flight sim PCs, which is why we are here today uh, speaking to you guys and discussing a flight sim configuration. If you head over to here, you can see that we do systems for Microsoft Flight Simulator. Uh, we also do X-Plane and P3D as well, if that's what you're looking for. But today we're going to focus on a system built for uh, Microsoft Flight Simulator. So if you just click here, this will load you up uh, to our full range of uh, Microsoft Flight Sim dedicated machines. These are pre-built machines. They are all built and ready to go um, okay. straight out of so the box. What, what we're going to do is uh, go through the configuration, see what different options are available to us. Um, now, I know that a lot of people that watch this channel, not all, but a lot of people are, if not enthusiasts, they're very keen on uh, Microsoft Flight Simulator. And I see that your prices vary. Just looking here, £857, uh, uh, including VAT. All the way up to over three thousand pounds. I think we better. I think it'd be more appropriate for the channel if we selected maybe not the top end, but uh, something at the medium to high end. So, let's go through the uh, Strike Eagle Microsoft Flight Sim PC, if you don't mind, Dan. No problem. All we need to do is hit the customize button down here at the bottom of the page, and it will bring us straight into our selections here. Okay, so the first thing is the case. Uh, the case you've chosen is the H7 Flow NZXT, but you do offer other options as well, don't you? Yes, so if you once you're on this page, you can hit the edit button and that will load up all of our case options. We've got five pages worth of, of cases on uh, the flight sim machines. As you can see, you've got the NZXT H7 Flow selected here. Um, as the default. But when you're selecting a case, what are the main considerations that, that people should take into account or look for? Yeah, so the main consideration is obviously going to be do the components that you have selected fit inside of said case. So your probably biggest thing that you've got to worry about at the moment is going to be the uh, graphics cards. Obviously, we know the 40 series graphics cards, 4080, 4090. Um, they are massive, um, quite frankly. They are, they're, they're huge. They've got big coolers on them. They need lots of airflow to make sure they stay nice and cool. So that's why we've selected something like the H7 Flow, which is a upper mid tower. It's not quite a full tower, but it's a larger mid tower chassis. If you go down to select like the first page you're going to get all sorts of options on the much cheaper end of the of the scale then we've got all the way up to some of the more high-end heavily 
RGB comes with RGB fans, big full tower chassis that that we also offer as well. So we've got we've got the full range. But I think for this system and for most people, the NZXD um, H7 Flow is a really good starting point. It's got great airflow, good USBs for um, on the top. Particularly for flight simmers with all our various peripherals and what have you. I can never have enough USB ports and I end up, I actually use four external powered hubs, USB 3 hubs. So the number of USB ports is quite important to look at. And USB 3, if you can get USB 3, I think that's the preference at the moment. Um, yeah. And if I, I stand to be corrected, but USB 3 can feed through a little bit more power and slightly faster data transfer. Yeah, so it's faster faster data transfer and, and more power delivered to the uh, device, yeah. Okay, great. All right, so uh, there's a wide variety of cases. We've got airflow to consider. It comes with some fans. Most of them do, don't they? Yeah, all of the chassis will come with some some vans. The H7, for instance, comes with two. Um, and we typically move those to the front of the case so that you've got that bringing in the cool air and then you'll have your cooler and graphics card pumping the hot air out of the case. And if you if you had something like a 4090 or something, you'd probably have more extraction fans, I'd guess. Yes, yeah. If you've got something uh, like a 4090, then you can add through the configurator if you'd like okay. to improve the cooling. What about accessibility? Is it going to fit where you want to put it? Has it got enough space for adding extra hard drives and stuff like that? And most cases now, yeah, do have glass side panels. There's only a few that don't. Um, obviously, with the high-end hardware that you've got now, people do really like to see what's inside of them. So, mm. yeah, they do have glass panels. Mm. Okay, let's stay with the H7 then and move on. Ah, so now on to the meat of it, as it were, with the CPU, the, the actual process. And I see you've chosen an i7-13700KF, which is interesting, um, because all my dealings with Wired to Fire up to now have been very focused on the AMD um, 7800X3D. So it's an interesting choice. So two questions, Dan, why and what does the KF stand for? Yeah, so we'll, I'll go with the slightly easier for, uh, question first. Uh, the KF stands for, well, the F denotes that the CPU has no onboard integrated graphics. Um, as you, you we're going to be picking a discrete graphics card, you don't need that. It saves a little bit on the cost. And the K just means that the, the processor is, is unlocked, which means you, if you would like to, then you can dabble in the overclocking and tuning side of things to try and squeeze even more performance out of the processor if you would like to. The reason that we've gone for this over the 7800X3D is just because the 13700K is a slightly better all-round chip. It's great for flight sim. It's also great for video editing and heavy multi-threaded workloads. And so it's very. If you're somebody like me, where I do video editing and mm. rendering and what have yep. you, uh, you're saying uh, the Intel chip generally operate performs better. But if I purely flight sim, you're saying you choose the 7800X3D. Yes, yeah. So if you're purely flight sim based, and you and you're just looking to do flight sim, then. As you can see here, for an extra forty-eight pounds plus, obviously it will change the motherboard and stuff like that. But for forty-eight pounds more, then you can get yourself the seventy-eight hundred X three D, and that will be great for for flight and sim. You haven't chosen the thirteen nine hundred K, which is the top of the line. You've gone one step yeah. back to the thirteen seven hundred. Yeah. Why? Wh why have you done that? For what we're doing with the machine, flight sim the. The 13700KF and the 13900K are very, very, very similar in performance. Because Flight Sim can't take advantages of the extra cores that the um, 13900K has and the minimal difference in cache and clock speed, the performance numbers for Flight Sim specifically don't particularly justify the 200 odd pounds price difference that you have to pay 
um, to get that. So unless you're super infu- uh, super enthusiast and you're streaming on Twitch and you're creating YouTube content and stuff like that, then I think the 13700K is the more logical choice. One of the chips that has been very popular up to now is uh, the 5800. Yeah, so previously the 5800X3D was probably our go-to um, choice for processor pr- um, before the, the newer one. Um, and that's just because it offers a really, really good price to performance value. The only problem with it now is that it is based on the AM4 platform, which really offers no upgradability or future-proofing mm. in the slightest. So for a system of this specification and price point, it's hard to justify choosing something like that, especially when there's better options. It was a very good choice. However, now, unless you're on quite a strict budget, I would definitely look at either the 13700K F4 or, or another CPU. And if money's no object, then 13900K or the, I'm going to guess the Ryzen 9 7950 X3D? Yeah, if money's no object, then it's either 13900K or 7950 X3D, both of which are going to give you as good a performance as you're going to get currently. So either or. And that'll or, cost really. you another two to three hundred pounds. So you look, yeah, two hundred. Depending on your choice, yeah. Yeah, depending on your choice, yeah, two to three hundred. Cooler. I yeah. see you've chosen a uh, two hundred and forty millimeter water cooler. Um, mm-hmm. I would have expected uh, the three twenty. I think it is. Yeah, three sixty mil. So three sixty. Yeah, we. Yeah. So we've gone for the two hundred and forty mil as it is plenty to handle the 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 13700kf um it'll keep things cool and reasonably quiet however you can go for a 360 it will make things cooler and more quiet it's up to you really um we reckon 240 at a minimum if you want to go for a 360 just for a gives you a bit of upgradability if you want to put in a 3900k or something later down the line give a little bit of future proofing would be to add the 360 yeah, we can we can certainly add so that. Let's on. As add you can, that. Just as you can see, that's twenty six pounds more. Yeah. For twenty six pounds, to me, it's a no brainer. Mm, yeah, yeah, definitely worth considering if yeah. if your and budget allows you know, it. When it comes to cooling, just again, my personal opinion: you bigger is better. You've got okay. options as well, like the the Noctua's. If you're not a big fan of a water cooling pump and and, and radiator, however. They're extremely, extremely reliable as well. So it's not really anything that you need to worry about. But aren't they? Uh... They're quite big. So the yeah, NHD 15 is very, very big, very, very big. And uh, make, sometimes can make upgrading things in your computer a little bit mm. difficult. Um, mm. It takes up so much space. Yeah. Okay. All right, we'll leave. We'll switch it to the 360 then. Thank you. Thermal paste, we won't go into the detail there. I know they're different thermal pastes. Um, do they really make a difference? Which which type of thermal paste do you have? They do make, it can make a slight difference. Um, however, it's much more important that it is just applied correctly um, rather than spending that extra money or more. So we, we can just move on from, from that. Okay. It's yeah, more important that it is. Okay. And now to another big one, the graphics card. Um, yes, probably. This is the probably num- the biggest. Yeah, number one choice. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> definitely. Um, and yeah, you've we'll chosen the 4070 Ti. Yeah, so we've gone with the 4070 Ti as it's probably the the first card that will handle every flight sim scenario to a reasonable and well and good level. So it will do 4K ultra settings 1440p ultra settings ultra wide and also obviously one of your big interests uh virtual reality it's good enough to handle that sort of thing as well so it's it's sort of the best mid to top end card available at the moment without obviously breaking the bank with something like a 4090 yeah it's the top end of the mid-range cards i would Mm. say and that it it allows for vr at at sort of medium levels on the monitor and that it's fine now, way back when, I see it's got 12 gigabyte of uh, memory. Now, way back when, 8 gig was considered golden uh, number, but I don't think that's the case anymore. I think 12 is the minimum these days and preferably 16 gig in terms of memory. I don't know what your views are, Dan. Yeah, as 
things have moved on and games have become more graphically intensive and flight sim has become more graphically intensive 12 gig now is probably what i'd recommend the minimum if you're going above 1440p in resolution so that's 1440p ultra wide and obviously vr so i would say that 12 gig now is the minimum unless you're sort of on a more on a more budget end of things in terms of the monitor i see that yeah. stepping up to a 4080 would be 385 pounds or thereabouts yeah you're looking at 385 for the for a 4080 and a um, grand for the 4090 wow yeah and roughly a thousand pounds for a 4090 yeah, yeah. If you're a real enthusiast that's the one to go for yeah what is interesting is we're currently at on the 4070 Ti, but if we have a look at the Radon 7900 XT 20 gigabyte, that's only mm. another extra 50 quid. Yeah. That's, that's quite attractive too, isn't it? Yeah, so we do have the um, 7900 XT with 20 gigabytes. Um, the main reason that we've not chosen it for a system like this is because of the um, sometimes issues that it has with compatibility compatibility with VR headsets and also the fact that it lacks some of those NVIDIA features like DLSS and frame generation, which really pushed the 4070 ahead of that card in, in specifically Flight Sim. If you wanted it for something else, then we certainly would recommend it. It's a very, very good card. All right. Thank you. Let's stay, I think, with the uh, 4070 Ti for now. Let's move on. Right. Okay. Memory. Ah, now this is an area where my knowledge is a little bit lacking and I think it's confusing for many people between DDR4 and DDR5. For example, my system has got DDR4 3200 megahertz. You're showing the DDR5 6000 megahertz. So just doing the sums in my head, I would assume that that DDR5 is twice as fast as the memory I've got in my system. But from what we were discussing earlier, that's not the case. No, so if we open this up, yeah, unfortunately it may look like it is, um, but DDR5 um, is not double the speed of DDR4. It, it mainly increases the bandwidth of the memory, so the amount of data that can be pushed through it um, over DDR4, that's where the biggest difference is. That mainly affects not your top end FPS, but gives you a bigger boost in your 1% lows. So your 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 stutters aren't as bad, um, but you will gain about 5 to 15%. It really does vary depending on the application and how how it uses um, the, uh, the memory. What I'm glad to see is that you've got 32 gig there, because that would be my recommendation. Mm -hmm. I mean, again, turn the clock back and we always used to recommend 16 gig. But I think in today's world, 32 gig is, for me, is a sweet spot, uh, if not slight overkill. Uh, but I do see a lot of people putting in 64 gig, and I'm not sure they're seeing the, the benefit of that, particularly in Microsoft Flight Simulator. Yeah, so now, yeah, 32 gig is definitely what I would recommend as the default, and it will do for just about anything, really. The only reason we would personally recommend or we would say get 64 gig would be to get uh would be if you are editing videos and streaming and creating content and stuff like that for flight sim i'm yet to find a scenario in my testing um where we've broken the 32 gig mark uh so for most people i think 32 gig is fine we do have options for 464 gig if you do want to to look into it um or, or you do do the video editing side of things but i think 32 gig is the is the sort of the, the perfect place to be at the moment i think ddr5 memory has really dropped in price quite considerably yes the, yeah definitely come down a lot in price since it yeah. was first um, uh, first released i see that you're not even offering ddr4 now no, so we don't offer DDR4 on any systems over like a certain price point because if you're spending said amount of money, um, it would you would be doing yourself a bit of a putting yourself in a bit of a bad situation for later down the line if you want to upgrade or something like that because 
soon DDR4 is not going to be on the boards or, or, or at all, so you're not going to have the option for that. So you're going to have to then pay to upgrade it when you could keep reusing your DDR5 now for a good few years. 16 gig is minimum, in my personal opinion, uh, mm -hmm. for Microsoft Flight Simulator. Recommended 32 gig. Yeah, definitely. Yep. Motherboard. Yes, right. Lots of options in motherboards. The main considerations for a motherboard is connectivity, expandability, and whether it has the features that you need. So we've gone for the default of the Z790P Wi-Fi. It's a great starting point with four USB 3s and four USB 2s, um, Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, and 2.5 gig LAN, along with three ports for your NVMe SSDs. Reasons why you might want to choose a slightly more expensive board is if you want to start tinkering with things like overclocking. Um, if, if you're interested in that sort of thing, the, the, the better the board, the better your um, overclocking features are. I won't go into the specific details, but more expensive boards typically have yeah better um, things like VRMs. Uh, and then some of the more high-end workstation boards have things like 10 gigabyte ethernet and, and thunderbolt um which if you're into sort of content creation and you need that super fast connection um via ethernet or thunderbolt then your more expensive boards tend to have those and i see all your boards have got wi-fi yeah every board that we do now um we offer they all, they all do have wi-fi 6 and bluetooth 5.2 so um gone are the days where you had to get an adding card um from for most of our boards anyway is that just technology moving forward it's sort of I included think, with most motherboards these days yeah i think unless it's a specifically quite a budget and i'm talking yeah right at the budget end of systems i think everything does now have a have a um, wi-fi card built into it okay storage now i think this storage, is a yeah. gray area in terms of knowledge for a lot of people that are not too PC savvy. And that's who this video is aimed at after all. If you're a technophobe, you have to just acknowledge that we are generalizing in this video. We can't cover the massive wide expanse of hardware options that are available. Dan, just for the benefit of the video, mm. I see you've got NVMe, uh, yeah. um, one terabyte offered, but can you just run through what the options uh, for memory storage are and what what the advantages are of of NVMe, etc.? Yeah, so to do a quick overview of, you've obviously got your traditional hard disk drives, um, which I'm sure most people are um, familiar with. They're the ones with the little spinning disks inside. You've then got um, SATA-based, now that's the connector, so, um, how it connects to the computer. You've then got SATA-based SSDs, which are your sort of middle of the range in terms of speed. And then you've got the newest and generally quickest, um, which are the M.2 NVMe drives, which is what we suggest for FlySim and directly onto your motherboard and are typically the fastest. Now, obviously you can get PCI 3, 4 and 5 drives, um, but I won't go into the massive just, detail of it, but... Yeah, but jumping back to the motherboard then, <clears throat> the number yeah. of NVMe, which is non-volatile memory, Yeah. Um, yes. the number of NVMe slots could be important to certain people, so that's another yeah. thing to, to watch out yeah. for. Yeah, that's something, another thing to, yeah, just definitely to look out for um, how many NVMe drives you may want to add to the machine. Now, most boards will have a minimum of two, um, more expensive ones uh, may have up to four. For most people, two is going to be plenty, but obviously double check on the motherboard. Uh, um. And uh, I think that the NVMe drives, of course, it varies, depends on which one you buy. Mm -hmm. But if you're looking at the top end traditional hard disk drive and the top end NVMe drives available for, for gaming type systems. I mean, it, it's substantially quicker, isn't it? Yeah, so your average brand new out the box 7200 RPM hard disk drives probably going to run at 
250 megabytes a second. Mm -hmm. um, and you're looking at, for the newest, fastest NVMe drive, you're looking at sort of 7 gig a second, basically. I mean, so that's, that's a massive difference. A massive difference. Um, obviously, not all the drives are that sort of speed. Um, you can get ones that are in between, sort of. The most common speed, I would say, is around the 4 gigabyte a second mark. Mm. Um, and that's where it's... The price to performance value of that is very, very good. Um, you okay. can get Great. Yeah, a terabyte for a very reasonable price. Now, you've got other storage options. Now, the one thing I like to do is I put my Windows operating system on one drive and all my Microsoft Flight Simulator stuff on another and archive on another type thing. Mm -hmm. So this is an option to add more storage if one wants. Yes, so yeah, we've got options here. Um, you've got your system drive, which is what we'll install your Windows on. Uh, we then got options for other storage drives. So say you want to have a drive for your, for your flight sim and then uh, a hard drive for your uh, family photos or something like that. You can obviously select those um, there. We, we, much like Mark, definitely recommend an NVMe for your system drive and then... Depending on the size of your community folder, you may want to think about yeah. getting a, a storage drive to put your uh, flights in on. So moving on, uh, the next one of note is power supply. Um, yes. Yeah. And Open interestingly up. there, Dan, you've got a 750 watt power supply for the system. Yep. I instinctively would have gone for an 850 or 1000 for the system. So the reason we've gone for a 750 is we'll do the job for what you've got in there now. However, I definitely agree with what you've said there, that something like the Corsair Shift um, ATX 3.0, 850 or 1000 watt gives you that upgradability if you would like to add additional higher performance components later down the line so i think the 850 is a good price point and will handle most graphics cards that are available now um so it'll do up to a 4080 very comfortably 4090 at a push and then yeah, if i was going 4090 i'd probably go the 1000 watt yeah for a thousand if you if you're looking for a 4090 then yeah a thousand watt is definitely what you want to be want to be aiming for uh, just an interesting note about the 4090. I've pushed my 4090 as hard as I can 4K with the Furmark uh, bench test um, and left it for an extended run. And the most I've ever had it draw is about 470 watts. It's never gone above that. And that was just a peak and then back down again. Yeah, yeah the, the 600 watts I've never seen or experienced, uh, which was all the furore at the time of release. On the power supply. I also cause... see that um, yeah, this RM850, the one that's highlighted there, is an ATX 3.0 power supply. Yeah. Um, can you just explain the difference between that and uh, the uh, standard modular power supplies? Yeah, so um, the basic of it is that it comes with the a cable to use for the um, 12 volt high, high power cable for the new graphics cards that so it is capable of putting out 600 watts across that cable with no problem at all it's also designed better to handle the um, those micro spikes of where the newer graphics cards had would spike and pull a lot more power than what they're rated for so it's it's got slightly better capacitors in that sense where it can handle it Okay, so let's change the power supply to the 850 watt, um, uh, the Corsair Shift, which I think the Shift is the one that's got the cabling on the side, isn't it, Dan? Yes, yes, they're the ones with the cabling on the side. So once again, it's another one of those things where it makes right. it much they, easier for someone yeah. to upgrade it or, or add cables to it later down the line if they they're need to. That's relatively new, that Shift, isn't it? Yeah, they're very yeah, and they're a new new market, new product to market, I should say. Okay, then you've got options to add additional fans for cooling, yep. etc. Uh, something mm -hmm. you'd probably do if you're going to put a forty ninety in. You'd want maybe yep. one or two extraction fans. Okay, sound card, network adapters. I think we've covered those. Windows. Just a note to those people watching that your OEM license to use Windows is tied to your motherboard. Okay, so where does that leave us then? 2,215, that mm -hmm. includes 20% uh, VAT here in the UK. 
Uh, yes, yeah. So it's an NZ H7 case, 13700 KF, 4070 Ti graphics card. So if we had gone with the 4080, that would have been more two and a half, two points, 2,600 pounds thereabouts. I'm yeah, so you had in, uh, what was it, 385 pounds yeah. it would have been. Yeah, so just uh, over two and just over... 2,600. And a 4090 would have chucked in another grand at least. About that, yes, yeah. Yeah. So if you scroll down, um, obviously you can see you've got total free, we do free delivery. Um, and at the moment we're going to be running a small promo on all of our flight sim systems across the range. So if you use the code uh, SIMHANGER, you'll get yourself for the next month uh, 5% off your, your total. So that's going to knock the price of this down by about a hundred pounds or so. So there you can see it there. So that brings the total to 2,105 pounds and 19 pence. Well, thank you to Wired to Fire for that discount. And if any of you want to take advantage of that, please feel free to do so. Bear in mind, it's for the UK only. Um, it's not practical or economic to ship to Europe or America or, or something of that nature. But again, the focus of this video has been on to help those that are not that PC savvy in terms of selecting what components and what is the thought process behind the selection of, of those components and so on. Now, Dan and I are going to follow up this video. We're going to take the PC that we've just configured we're going to get together at a not too distant point in the future and we're actually going to build that PC and I'll be going down to Wide to Fire's headquarters to do that. So stay tuned. Dan, thank you very much for joining us. I really appreciate your time. No problem, Mark. Thank you very much for having me once again. My pleasure. Thank you very much for watching. Uh, stay well, look after yourselves. I'll see you all again in the not too distant future. And ciao for now.